So the first thing really is why do you need such a long name to, to describe this disease? And really, um, it was really just a description of the disease characteristics. So um, mitosis means a, a disease. Um, the lymph part means it involves the lymphatic channels, these little um, channels that run in parallel with the blood vessels and drain tissue fluid. And the disease has a particular tropism for, for the lymphatic channels. Angio um, is just uh, the Greek word for vessels, uh, suggesting that it's the lymphatic vessels. And lyomyo is uh, a word for smooth muscle. And uh, lamb is actually a disease where smooth muscle-like cells involve the lymphatics. And that's really all, all that means. Two other bits of terminology that are important to sort of know are uh, these two phrases, sporadic lamb and, and TSC lamb. So most people who are here today that have lamb have sporadic lamb. So that is when the disease just occurs on its own. And that's a very rare situation, perhaps 300 people in the country. But lamb is actually quite common in one setting, and that's for people who have a genetic disease called tuber sclerosis. And when people have lamb in that context, we call that TSC lamb, so tuber sclerosis complex related lamb. So the, although from the lung disease point of view, the, the two things are really pretty much exactly the same. Uh, so m everything that I say about the sporadic form uh, applies to the TSC form, really. So as I've alluded to, and as you all know, lamb is a very rare disease. In the UK, probably affects about five per million women. Uh, in this country, and that's similar to other countries in the world that, 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 that we've looked at. Um, there are about 300 people with lamb that we know about in the UK. What we also know is that there are mild forms that have been underdiagnosed, and there are also people with actually more advanced lamb who've been told they've got asthma or emphysema, smoking-related lung disease. So it's a, it's a rare disease, but it's, there probably are more people out there who have lamb. As I said, in the context of tuber sclerosis, lamb's actually pretty common. And by the age of 20, about 10% of adult women will have lung cysts consistent with lamb. And that rises to 80% of women with tuber sclerosis by the age of 40. Although a lot of these people actually don't have symptoms from the disease and it, it, it can be mild. So lamb's a pretty rare disease unless you've got tuber sclerosis. The other really curious thing about lamb is that it pretty much only affects women, and it's probably the most sexually specific disease that there is. I mean, it, actually, one in a hundred people with breast cancer are actually men. Um, so lamb's more female-specific than breast cancer. And although there are one or two men reported to have lamb, it's an extremely rare phenomenon. And we think this. Um, <coughs> Uh, we think this is probably due to oestrogen. So men uh, rarely get lung cysts, but they really don't become ill with it normally. And so it, women's oestrogen levels are higher than men, and actually lamb cells respond to oestrogen. If you grow the little cells that cause the lamb disease in the laboratory, you can, see, you can measure the little receptors that they res use to respond to oestrogen, on, the, on those lamb cells. If you add oestrogen into them, they grow more quickly. And they tend, to, in models, they tend to spread around, the, spread around the body more rapidly if there's oestrogen present. And we think, therefore, oestrogen is probably bad for lamb. So we suggest that women with lamb avoid oestrogen-containing medicines. So the combined oral contraceptive pill that has oestrogen in, we think is probably bad for lamb. So we suggest people have alternative methods of birth control. Pregnancy can accelerate uh, lamb when hormone levels change dramatically. And on the more positive side, after you go through the menopause and your natural oestrogen levels fall, uh, the disease tends to progress more slowly in most cases. So lamb is a rare oestrogen-driven disease that predominantly affects women. Um, what type of disease is it? Well, lamb is a disease in which a, an abnormal group of cells that we've inventively called lamb cells, uh, accumulate in the body. And for some reason, they, they seem to be targeted to the lungs and also the lymphatic tissue. Uh, as um, these, these cells, they've lost their normal growth control mechanism. And later in the morning when I talk about um, 
when I talk about treatments, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. But these lamb cells don't behave like normal cells. They don't stop growing when they're supposed to. So they build up, they get in the way, and they, they, they cause uh, problems in the organs that they involve. Uh, and these problems really in, include cysts in the lung, so little air spaces. And these cysts are really what cause most of the symptoms. So if the cysts burst, they cause collapsed lungs or pneumothorax. Um, if there's a lot of them, they cause breathlessness. And sometimes the lamb cells block the lymphatic channels and cause the lymphatic fluid to build up in the wrong places. So this is... Um, this is what lamb looks like um, in CT scans. And most people get diagnosed when they have some sort of chest symptoms and they end up having a CT scan. So um, just to orient you, when you have a CT scan done, you're um, usually lying flat on a table and the scanner's going right around you. So in this picture here, the table's at the bottom of the picture. So uh, this is the backbone here. This is the also this is the heart. And at the top of the picture, is, uh, is, is, is your stomach. And so what we're looking at here is a cross-section about this high up end on. Um, and these, uh, these um, grey areas are lung tissue. This grey colour is normal background lung tissue. The little white things are blood vessels. They're normal. What's, um, what's abnormal are these, um, these round black um, air spaces. And these are the cysts. And you can see they're just dotted around throughout the lung fields, although the rest of the lungs look normal. So in, uh, this, this person doesn't have very many cysts, and they have mild disease, fairly normal uh, breathing <coughs> tests. Um, and the cysts are fairly characteristic in land. They have little walls around them, and they're usually round. Um, and those things are all important when you're a cyst sort of spotter like me, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, spend a lot of time thinking about those sorts of things. So that's a characteristic CT scan. And usually when someone has that, when they're a woman, the penny sort of drops and they go, oh, actually, they, the, the, those symptoms of breathlessness are not um, asthma. They're probably lamb or that pneumothorax wasn't just a spontaneous pneumothorax that can occur in a healthy person. It's probably because of this. Um, so... Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about now about the major symptoms with lamb and what underlies them. And nearly half of women who um, develop lamb, their first symptom is, is, is pneumothorax or collapsed lung. So this is a, an ordinary chest X-ray of someone with a pneumothorax who has lamb. Um, and you can see um, this is... Uh, actually the left lung on the right of the picture, this is the right lung, this is the heart in the middle. Um, and you can see on the normal side between the ribs, you can see these little sort of light grey lung markings. On the right uh, lung, there's actually, in between the ribs, it's all dark, and that's because there's no lung tissue there to absorb the x-rays. The lungs collapse down, and the, the lung is just this little thing here, which, which should be filling the whole side of the chest. And the symptoms of this, as some of you probably know already, are usually sharp chest pain that's worse when you breathe and breathlessness that comes on reasonably suddenly. This, as I say, nearly half of women, this is their first symptom of lamb. And about two thirds, maybe three quarters of women will have a pneumothorax at some point um, if they have lamb. And some people never have them, of course. So. Um, Pneumothorax occurs when the little lung cyst that you saw on the CT scan um, bursts and leak air out around the lung and the lungs allow to fall away from the chest wall, so, um, which causes these symptoms. Pneumothorax in lamb can be difficult to treat. If the hole seals up on its own, sometimes no treatment's required. But if there's a lot of air and the hole doesn't seal up, um, you may, need to, you may need to intervene to, uh, to fix that. So this is just a little cartoon of, um, of what happens in a pneumothorax. So this is the chest wall. On the normal side, the lungs right snug up against the chest wall. There's nothing in between the two. Whereas in the pneumothorax, the cyst has leaked air out into this, um, into this potential space here, allowing the lung to fall away from the chest wall. And... Uh, Sometimes this air is reabsorbed, but as I say, if it's a big pneumothorax or if the hole doesn't seal up on its own, you need to put in a chest drain, which is a tube that goes in between the ribs into this space um, and, and draws the air out. 
usually this is all that's required, but sometimes if the hole doesn't seal up and the air continues to drain out through the drain, uh, surgery is needed to, uh, to fix this. Um, and usually if you have more than one pneumothorax, we recommend that, uh, that an operation is performed to, um, uh, to prevent these happening again. The, uh, the next sort of classical uh, lung problem that, uh, that LAM causes is a build-up of lymphatic fluid around the lung. Now, lymphatic fluid is, is fluid that's reabsorbed from the tissues. It has lots of immune cells. It also carries fat. Um, and it's a milky-looking substance. Normally, you're completely unaware of it. Your lymphatic system doesn't really... Uh, uh, impact upon you in any way. When it gets blocked in LAM, this fluid can um, build up in the lymphatics and sometimes leaks out into, into body cavities. Um, in this case, it's around the lung. And so and this, is a, this is the normal side, this time the right lung. And on the left side, this sort of white area at the bottom next to the heart here is where fluid has built up in the, in the pleural cavity. And it's just squishing the lung up a little bit. And so that makes you progressively more breathless. This, uh, this buildup of chylus fluid can occur at other sites too, but round the lung is the most common place. And this chylus fluid, uh, this is called a chylus pleural effusion. Um, sometimes we drain these out uh, very Often nowadays, though, we use um, drug treatment to, uh, to fix these, and I'll talk about that later on today. Yep. The other area where the lymphatics become involved is, is in the abdomen. The lymphatic channels run um, from all points of the body, and they form slightly larger channels in the, in the centre of the uh, uh, pelvis and abdomen. Uh, and these can become involved by a lamb uh, also. Most of the time, this doesn't cause any symptoms. It just get a bit enlarged. There's plenty of room in your abdomen for these to expand without you really knowing about it. This is a CT scan of someone's pelvis. So we're about this high up. So again, back, front. These are the hip bones here. Um, and this is the bladder. And this cystic structure here is, um, is, is an enlarged lymphatic. And this probably causes urinary frequency and just a bit of discomfort, this sort of thing. You can see it's just pushing on the bladder there. These are relatively rare, actually. About 10% of women with LAM will have these types of things. But when someone comes to see us for the first time in Nottingham at the LAM Centre, we always get a CT scan of the abdomen to see if this is happening, amongst other things. Um, as I say, small enlargements of lymphatic tissue, common. Big things like this, much less common. And as I say, most of them don't really cause symptoms. And these are called lymphangioliomyomas. What's much more common than this in, in the abdomen are these things. So you know, we're getting good at CT by now. So um, here again, CT scan of the abdomen about here, backbone, um, kidney. Uh, so this is the kidney. And this little sort of blob sitting on the side of it, which is probably about two centimeters across, so a bit less than an inch, is a benign tumor uh, with fat in it called an angiomyolipoma. About half of women with LAM will have one of these in the kidney. Usually, they don't really cause any problems at all. They just sit there. But it does tell us that the association of the lung cysts on the chest CT and one of these in the kidney, that tells us that this is definitely LAM. These are both rare things, and the two of them together means that it's definitely LAM. Um, so, as I say, they're benign. You don't, if, you've, if they're small, you don't need to do anything at all about them. They're usually in the kidneys. Sometimes there are other places. Quite common in LAM. Um, the main problem with these is if they get big, and big means more than about four centimetres across, the risk of them bleeding um, increases. And these bleeds, these tumours also have quite big blood vessels. And the big ones are at risk of sudden bleeding. And if that happens, then you usually it's quite painful. You may have blood in your urine. You get flank pain. Um, and usually people present to hospital because of the pain. Uh, and um, that usually requires emergency treatment. So when we see somebody with LAM, we always scan their kidneys to make sure that, uh, that we, we, we can treat that before that's required. And as I say, most of these can safely be observed. So if you do a CT scan or an MRI scan or even an ultrasound scan, which is a very quick and easy test of the kidneys, we, you can usually see these. 
So those are, those are the main sort of features in LAM. So the first symptoms of LAM um, are usually respiratory. So, um, and it's sort of changing. Now everybody has a CT scan when they go to the doctor for nearly anything. Um, we, we find that we're diagnosing LAM in different groups of people. So um, a few years ago, we surveyed all the literature that there was on LAM up to this point, um, about 2006. Um, and most women had either, had their first symptom of LAM was either breathlessness, uh, this sort of beige colour, or the blue colours, uh, pneumothorax or collapsed lung. Other respiratory symptoms like cough um, are in the white thing. And um, the other category is either being found fortuitously or having kidney tumours, and which led to the diagnosis of LAM. When um, the NIH the, uh, in the state set up a big registry here, um, a few years later, things had changed. So the average age at diagnosis early on was mid-30s. Um, they'd started diagnosing uh, LAM in slightly older people, the average age sort of creeping up. Um, and what you also see is that fewer people, breathlessness and pneumothorax were the first symptom. Other things were beginning to creep in. This, this was really just because LAM was recognised as a disease which affected other organs, and this was leading to the diagnosis of the lung disease. And actually, the patients that we look after in Nottingham at the LAM centre, you see quite a lot of people now get referred in because of kidney problems, leading to diagnosis or because they have tuberous sclerosis and they get, they get screened for LAM now. Um, and also, and we're continuing to uh, diagnose LAM in people who are older um, than, than previously thought. So it's no, no longer really an exclusive disease of young women who get pneumothorax. We're seeing it in, in a much wider range of people who have less typical features. So... Um, because LAM's a multi-system disease, it can cause a variety of symptoms, and these vary a huge amount. I mean, some people have no symptoms at all from LAM, and it's discovered completely by accident, actually, or when they're screened for something else. I have people who had a car accident, um, and they got taken to hospital, and they were worried about them, so they had the whole body scan to make sure they didn't have trauma that they couldn't see, and they ended up getting diagnosed with LAM. Previously, they really hadn't had symptoms. And so... This sort of thing. So there may be no symptoms of LAM. The most common symptoms really uh, are lung symptoms, predominantly breathlessness. And that happens when the cysts build up and uh, just replace the, uh, the lung tissue. The lungs don't work so efficiently, and particularly with exertion, people start to get short of breath. Some people, when they have a lot of cysts, the airways um, close preferentially when they breathe out, and this can cause wheezing. Wheezing is just a noise caused by narrowed airways. So breathlessness and wheezing common. If you get pneumothorax, sometimes you have chest pain. Some people don't know they've got a pneumothorax and just think, well, what's that? What, what, what are those chest pain sensations? And actually, it's a collapsed lung when they get it investigated. Cough's quite common. Um, some people cough up chylus fluid. Some people get lots of infections. Some people cough up little bits of blood. It's not usually a lot, just little dots. Um, and those, those are slightly less common symptoms, but do occur. And then sometimes the abdominal lymphatic problems can cause bloating, swelling of the abdomen, discomfort, those sorts of symptoms. The problem with... Um, one of the other major problems with LAM... And, Perhaps the most common symptom after breathlessness is actually fatigue. And I don't know how many of you suffer from fatigue. And it's sort of slightly difficult to quantify. Because whenever you talk to someone about, do you, have, you know, do you feel excessively tired? And they go, yes, but you know, I've got a really busy job and the kids are running around and da 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 um, But actually, if you ask everybody with LAM, what's very obvious is that fatigue's a major feature. And people feel disproportionately tired. And that's, that's separate from symptoms of breathlessness. So symptoms of fatigue in LAM are, are pretty normal and pretty common. The tricky bit, of course, is that um, loads of illnesses can cause exactly these symptoms. Asthma, spontaneous pneumothorax, smoking-related lung disease, all sorts of other things. And so because these LAMs are rare and these symptoms are common in other diseases, it very often takes a long time to get diagnosed with, uh, with LAM. Um, and lots of people have already probably been through diagnosis of asthma and all sorts of things which turned out not to be true. 
I don't know how many people here got diagnosed with other things before they were told they had lamb, but um, it's quite common. So um, as time passes, um, the progression of lamb is really variable. So this slide here um, looks at uh, people with lamb's lung function in the centre where I work. Um, each one of these lines is somebody's lung function uh, over time. And these are patients on no treatment, these are patients on treatment, and these are the sort of average changes. So people who aren't being treated, on average, lung function falls a little bit faster than it, than it would normally do if you didn't have a lung disease. If that's happening rapidly, we often offer people treatment with this drug rapamycin, which I'm going to talk about in detail later on this morning and one of the other talks. Um, and so these treatments are available, and it I will just suffice to say it tends to stabilise the lung disease. So people without treatment at our centre, their FEV1, which is a measure of lung function and airflow, which changes in land, falls by about 70 mils a year. And if you're on rapamycin, that almost goes to zero on average. So as time goes by, we evaluate people's lung function. If it's falling rapidly, we usually offer them treatment with, with rapamycin. If everything's very steady, actually, we usually don't. So... Uh, in terms of what happens as time passes and prognosis, it's, re it's a really variable disease. And this slide, um, these are called kaplan meier graphs. Um, so what, happen what, what these graphs show is when they come down, it's when people um, reach certain points in, the, in their disease course. Um, and each one of these lines is a different level of breathlessness in, in this graph. So um, if you're short of breath when hurrying, if you walk more slowly than your friends on the flat, um, if you're breathless on the flat after 100 yards, or if you're very breathless and don't get out of the house much. So if you look along the bottom, this is, this is a 20-year observation period, so we surveyed women with lamb to say what their level of breathlessness was and correlated that with when lamb, lamb symptoms started. So if we see a lamb patient for the first time, and they say, well, how are my symptoms likely to progress? What we can say on average, after 10 years, um, you're more, you probably walk more slowly than your friends on the flat. Although 5 to 10% of people will have quite difficult breathlessness. Um, and, uh, but that, that's a much more uh, unusual scenario. In terms of overall survival, um, people frequently look on the internet and see 10 years and if they look at an old textbook, they'll see four years and all sorts of scary stuff. The, probably the most accurate um, estimates come from uh, a survey done in the USA in an epidemiological study we did. Um, and roughly 29, 30 years from the first symptom is the average um, survival. So some people doing a bit not so well as that, some people doing much better. And actually, after 10 years, really, 9 out of 10 people with lamb are still alive. Um, and the survival really is, is not as bad as you frequently read on the internet. The other good bit of news is all of these data were taken long before this treatment, rapamycin, that slows the decline of lung function was available. So for people being diagnosed now, the outcome is likely to be much better than these, these figures. And although these figures were quite reassuring when they came out, they're likely to be now out of date, and the survival is likely to be a lot better than that. So it's a, as I say, Lamb's a very variable disease, and if you need to think about your own prognosis, you need to talk to someone who looks at all the aspects of your case. So uh, once you've been diagnosed, how should you be monitored? Well, clearly you need to be reviewed regularly and by your physician. Um, if disease is fairly steady, you might just go once a year and have some breathing tests done. Um, certainly at the onset, you might go more rapidly, um, or, or, or if the disease is progressive, you, you, you might be seen uh, two, three, four times a year rather than just annually. We usually follow people's breathing tests or their lung function tests. We measure this FEV1 measurement, uh, which, is, uh, which we understand the, the natural history of in lamb quite well. It's a good marker of disease. And we usually uh, measure this thing, the gas transfer or TLCO, which also informs us about how efficiently the lungs are working. So most people come and see us uh, two, two or three times a year, um, have their lung function measured, um, have a consultation. If you've got the kidney tumours, 
as half of women do. If they're small, we maybe just do an ultrasound every couple of years. If they're a bit larger, then we'll probably do that more frequently. And the reason for this is the bigger tumours tend to grow a little bit faster. So if your tumour is bigger than three centimetres, the chances of it growing are quite high. If it's a small tumour, less than a centimetre, usually don't change very much at all, and we can relax about those. So kidney scan, breathing tests, and then if anything happens in between times, and that's usually infections or, 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 or sometimes pneumothorax, obviously uh, you need to see your doctor then. So very briefly mention drug treatment. So a lot of people don't need any treatment for their lamb at all because it's mild and it, it may not be progressive. People with progressive disease um, often need different types of treatment to try and stabilise um, disease. The most simple treatment and the thing that m the majority of people are on are bronchodilators, so the types of inhalers people have who have asthma. And these, uh, these lines are lung function uh, or FEV1 before and after taking an inhaler. And you can see most of the lines in this small sample go up. So you get a small improvement in airflow with bronchodilators, and they might help breathlessness or, or, or dyspnea. Um, there's a drug called rapamycin, which I've already mentioned, which reduces decline in lung function, also makes the kidney tumours smaller. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in detail later, but that, that's an important treatment that we'll, that we'll talk about further. Um, there are trials of all sorts of things um, currently uh, uh, underway, uh, including um, other drugs that we can add into rapamycin. Um, other drugs that uh, just stand alone therapies. And so actually this is, there's a lot of research um, going on into LAM at the moment. It's a sort of, so was a, it's, you're, the chances of getting one of these new therapies now is much, much higher than it, than it was previously. So there's a lot of work going on. These are still experimental though. So the things that people use reliably are the bronchodilators and rapamycin. Some of the old treatments that block oestrogen are probably ineffective, and we tend not to use those routinely, although there are one or two people who um, might be considered for those therapies in certain situations. Um, and the, people used to think that this drug doxycycline might be helpful for LAM. Um, we did a trial of that, um, and unfortunately it wasn't, um, which is disappointing, it's an easy, cheap therapy, and, Six years of my time wasted, um, but um, it, it's important to, uh, to, to know that uh, it works. So, um, what else can you do for your lamb? Well, actually, um, being aware of the disease complications, knowing what to do if you get a pneumothorax, if you get chest pain and breathlessness, you should have an x-ray that day to see if you need treatment for pneumothorax. Um, getting vaccinated against influenza and against pneumonia, um, what to do um, if you're thinking about pregnancy, which is basically talk to your doctor first. Um, keeping active is very important, and there are rehab programs that help. Um, you should avoid oestrogen, as I've said, contraceptive pill or postmenopausally hormone replacements are out, really. And of course, um, smoking is never a good idea, particularly if you don't have lamb. And really, otherwise, um, the, there aren't too many rules. We usually say that lamb is uh, a slowly progressive disease. The, the course of it is very long. And um, so, we, you know, we just tell people to get on with their lives and be as normal as they can. Um, and really just take a little bit more care of themselves. So be careful about infections. If you get chest infections, don't let them drag on. Go and see your doctor early, you may need antibiotics um, rather than just the general advice to everyone else, which is, oh, just stay in and take it easy, it'll go away. Um, if you get significant chest or flank pain, you should go to A&E and have a, uh, a chest x-ray or maybe, a, uh, maybe have your abdomen evaluated if, if you think you have a pneumothorax or an angiomyopoma. And as I say, um, if you're considering pregnancy and the age when most women present um, is often during the time that they're thinking about, um, about uh, having children, 
you should discuss that um, with, your, with your physician so you understand the risks and benefits. As I say, lambs an estrogen-driven disease, and sometimes pregnancy can complicate the course of lambs. So it's best to sort of talk about that and be prepared for the issues. So uh, thanks very much.